David would have had to crank this microphone up a lot higher than I'm going to crank it up. Uh, well, actually, I'm much more than that. Um, but it's a very great pleasure to be here tonight. Um, just on a personal note, I've been asked to step in because David is unwell. Um, I met Leon and my wife and Tenny met Leon uh, shooting a little television series called A Country Practice all those years ago. And we learned very quickly, if you want to have a good time, you either hung with the writers or the band. Uh, we've known each other for many years. Leon was actually a, a great help in the fight to save Currawong Beach. Um, he's changed my life in many ways. I, I, this is a very unstructured speech, which is why I will never make a writer. Uh, it'll be a very short one too. Uh, Leon has been an incredible influence on us and many other people. We've been so blessed to have tremendous writers come through our lives. Many of them are in this room tonight. Their passion, their constant questioning, their hard drinking, their partying, their joie de vie is just something to behold and we have been just blessed to have them with us. So um, I have nothing but admiration for Leon and Penny and James and Katie. You've been an enormous part of our lives and what a fantastic night this is to see Gaze of Dogs. What a terrific name. And I devoured it, said Peter Carey. He ate it. So uh, that says something. I'll now just uh, read what David was going to read, to say. Uh, a little bit has been said previously. Uh, the Gaze of Dogs, great name. Uh, that's me speaking, not David. And is anyone from the media here, could you just say that Shane Withington stepped in for David Williams? <laughs> Withington with a TH. Yeah. <clears throat> um, firstly, huge apologies to Leon Lean and all of you for not making it tonight. I've known Leon for a long time, and if we're going to crudely divide the world into good guys and bad guys, Leon is very much a member of the former tribe. <laughs> Five years ago, I would have lived with the fact that the flu virus, in its capricious way, decided to strike me down. But six months ago, I had flu, decided to brave it, and had to be stretched off the plane, ended up in emergency, and was hospitalised with pneumonia. The doctor told me that I was lucky, as in the profession they call influenza A, the Ebola virus of the over 70s. <laughs> so at 77, much as I love Leon and Gaze of Dogs, I wasn't prepared for its launch to be my last earthly act. <laughs> but I can still say what I think about the book. When a friend asks you to launch a book, it's a little bit of worry. What if you hate it and have to lie? When Leon sent me the proofs, I must say I, must say, I didn't have that worry. I knew that from way back he was a consummate storyteller and that he knew how to make his characters real. And I wasn't disappointed. Within a page or two, I had to read on. The story opens as Ned Sheridan helps bury the mysterious Jack on the anarchy gem fields. They have to drill holes in the coffin so it will sink into the flooded hole. And who's Ailsa? The woman who comes to him after the funeral and tells him he has a brother he never knew existed. And what is the truth about Jack, the man they've just buried, whom Ned is sure had a much greater connection to his early life than he would ever admit to? Ned has felt this since he saw Jack's photo on a newspaper wrapping and it impels him to travel to where Jack is working on the anarchy gem fields to confront him. Ned is sure that this is the man who is part of his earliest memory, the man who delivered him to the care of the St Andrews Boys Hostel and told him you'll be well looked after. <laughs> but when Ned does find Jack, he says he's not Jack Wilson but Jack Rafel and he has no idea what Ned's talking about. So all Ned is left with is this conviction that Jack is lying and a weird and persistent fear of recurring images of burning dogs. Further back from that, all is blank. Ned, having come home early one night to find the love of his life, Kathy, in bed with his best friend, decides he's had enough of her, his best friend and Sydney and he'll go north and work on the anarchy gem fields 
and try and tease out more of the truth from Jack about the total blanks in his early memory. Like all good storytellers, Leon has set us up with some compelling question marks. He has ensured that we are compelled to keep reading to find the answers. But this book is so much more than just a page turner. Leon has taken us from Sydney into a world that's vividly exotic but totally real. Life is different on the gem fields, very different. And it would be tempting to say that Leon's characters, the exuberant and slightly mad Joe, Jimmy, Sparrow, and Taipan and the rest are larger than life, except they aren't. They're vivid and vividly drawn, but they fit perfectly into an ethos that allows and almost expects exotic behaviours to flourish. We feel that every character is real and engaging and that all of them are vital to the canvas of the story that Leon unfolds for us. And of course there's a villain, Hegarty, but a very real and recognisable villain. Hegarty is neoliberalism on the rampage. Use any method, brutal or devious, to plunder those who aren't as ruthless and cold and avaricious. Ned and his new friends watch with helpless rage as the Hegarty octopus, bit by bit, takes over the individual leases, hard won and hard worked, and adds them to his environment scarring lease, using huge machines to rip the ground apart in his haste to extract as many sapphires in as short a time as possible. I won't reveal one of the high points of the novel, how Ned and his friends all engineer for Hegarty to get his comeuppance, but you'll be cheering. Leon also introduces us to another world, the world of the Kari people, who he first encounters in tragic circumstances. They are drawn warmly, but without idealisation or condescension, as is his touching romance with Jess, a young First Nation woman. Leon is able to draw all his characters, warts and all, with such compassion and understanding that he's able to convincingly make us believe that community and caring for each other is still a thriving and vital part of the human psyche, despite all the attempts of our conservative rulers to tell us that the ideal satiety is competition red in tooth and claw. It's David Williamson, after all. <laughs> it's a rich picture of humanity Leon draws for us. We care about them all except, and rightly so, the awful Hegarty. And even he has fleeting moments of near redemption. When you finish this book, you haven't just finished a story. You've finished touching a touching and truthful examination of humanity. We are beset with difficulties, tragedies, sadnesses and frustrations, but we battle on as best we can. We aren't in Maggie Thatcher's universe where a person is pitted against a person in a relentless battle for material gain. We're still in a universe where the bonds between us still matter, where compassion and caring still exist, and where the strength of our human bonds make life worthwhile. My only regret on finishing this wonderful book is a sadness that Leon didn't start writing novels 20 years or more ago. <laughs> but thankfully, I'm sure after reading this one, it won't be his last, and I'll be there waiting for the next one. David Williamson. <laughs> it's time for the great man to speak, but after writing a country practice and then home and away where he got his touch for gritty reality, please welcome the man himself, Leon Saunders. <laughs>